So today we will just discuss this lecture which you have already uh, viewed. So um, it has been said by some people that the history of mankind is the history of uh, money seeking higher returns. So there is a lot of truth to this. I mean, a lot of things that we see in the patterns of history are all about people doing anything to make a profit. And that's actually one of the unique features of Islamic history that when uh, the Muslims spread through the world, it was not to make money for themselves. Although with our minds of today, it's very hard to understand that this is possible. So this seems uh, impossible to us. We think that surely they must have done this for the sake of conquest, glory, riches. But it is not so. You can prove it, but you have to study. So let us have a look at... Um, one thing to understand is that the international financial system is an artificial system. This is very important. It's not something which has just come about <coughs> naturally. There are, first of all, the structure of nations is also the result of our agreement to behave and think in certain ways. So, uh, the concept of a social construct, this is very important to understand. There are some things which are physical, is that wall over there and uh, buildings and rocks and trees and mountains and rivers, these are all parts of the physical world. But nations, Pakistan, India, England, these are not physical realities, these are not out there. Even though we think of them as the same, Pakistan is just as much a physical reality as uh, the K2 mountain, we think, because our, in our minds these two things are the same. But this is not really true. Pakistan exists because we all agree, those people in Pakistan, that okay, there will be a country which is called Pakistan, there it has a border, we are ready to die for it, other people are ready to kill for it, and yet, if the human beings were removed from the planet, nobody would know that there is any Pakistan or any India or any England. It would not, it would disappear because it is a human. It is, comes into existence by our agreement to make it so. This is a, I mean, the first time I um, realized this, it was a major um, shock for me that I was thinking that Pakistan is just as real as the K2 mountain and as the Ganga river, but it is not, it's just... And so, if today we all agree that, okay, from now on, all human beings are brothers and sisters, and there will be no nationality, so tomorrow there will be no Pakistan, no India, no England. So, it is just by our agreement that this thing exists. So just like that, the financial system that, okay, I will pay dollars if I buy goods from America and I will pay rubles if I buy goods from Russia, all of this is artificial. We can make other conventions and in fact in the Bretton Woods uh, Keynes said that there should be uh, trading should not be done in any particular nation's currency because that nation's currency will be will have a special place 
and it will cause many kinds of problems. So the uh, IMF was supposed to, was partly any Keynes, but the main idea of Keynes was that this SDR, the special drawing rights, which are a special currency, this would be the currency which would be used for trading. It doesn't belong to any one nation, but it is a basket of currencies from all nations. So that would be very sensible trading agreement. But that was not adopted. So SDRs do exist, but they are not used for international trade. In fact, the dollar system is there. And, uh, I don't know if you have read my article, The Lopsided System, which explains why this is so such a bad system, such an asymmetric system. So, this artificial system was created, was manufactured by us, it can be changed by us, it has benefits, it has its flaws. So today, to understand the world we live in, we have to understand what this system is because it has a lot of, you know, today Pakistan's economic problems that we are discussing about high deficits, balance of trade, uh, balance of payments, deficit, uh, fiscal deficit, many other issues. Uh, they are partly because of the uh, global financial system. So, that is why we need to study this, but there is a problem that uh, the truth is not easy to access because especially economics is designed to deceive people rather than to educate people. So the first myth is the neutrality of money. If you go and ask any of your friends studying in any other university in macroeconomics about money, they will tell you that money is neutral, money is a veil. This is what standard macroeconomics teaches. So let us discuss this. Why, why do people say money is neutral and what is the truth? So now I'd like to hear from you. Why? What is the standard argument for money is neutral? Why do, how do people convince students that money is neutral? The quantity theory of money. Yes, the quantity theory of money. Yes, but what does the quantity theory of money say? And why does it make sense? Actually, it's, I mean, this is, in order to, for, uh, for all powerful lies, there has to be a core element of truth in it that makes it believable. Otherwise, if it's completely lie, then it's uh, easy to rebut. But if there is some something in it which is true, that makes it easier to use to deceive people. So there is something, some an element of truth in the quantity theory of money. And what is that? That is the theory that if we double the quantity of money, all that will happen is that Price the prices will double and nothing else will change. Now, um, uh, does any, any do you understand the logic for this? Why it, I mean the logic that is given for this, not the yes. We assume that velocity is constant and uh, supply is constant. Actually, it does not mean constant. Yes, that's true. Uh, As a common That is uh, part of the assumption, but actually, that was what Keynes pointed out. Is this was. What is it related? To? Yeah. If you have excess capacity, yes. then, yes, so this is what Keynes said. Basically, one thing that Keynes said was that 
the standard theory that's it. that's why he called the general theory of employment because he said the standard neoclassical theory is a special theory it works when economy is at full employment but if the economy is not at full employment then the neoclassical theory fails actually it was classical at that time and he said so the general theory is which one which works even when you are at unemployment and he also said that the classical theory assumes that the economy is always at full employment so then uh, everything is uh, yani so it's automatically but it is not this is not true so why did kane say that money is not neutral in the short run or the long run yes what was the reasoning of kane yes anybody yes Not because the um, uh, the labors. When you say that the economy is not at full employment, then whenever you generate money, it will uh, increase employment, and uh, wages uh, are not uh, determined uh, on the basis of real wage. Rather, the labors are more uh, are more uh, concerned about the nominal wages. So any ex any uh, induced Uh, any money induced in the economy will increase the employment level, and the money will have its role. It's not neutral. Yeah, so that's correct. Yes. Yeah, because uh, if it, uh, if the economy is in a boom, uh, 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 the economy needs money, and then you have to inject money. Otherwise, the economy. Uh, if the economy is in a boom, then the economy needs money. No. Yeah. In recession, the economy needs money. So it's a. And so, uh, if it's in a boom, you need to take out money. And for in order to balance inflation and uh, inflationary gaps or recession and inflation, you have to uh, ma- manage it, and you have to have the right amount of money in the in the economy. That's I think what he is saying. Prices are also rigid. Huh? Prices are also rigid. That's prices are rigid. Very interesting. Yes. So trends of prices, jo long term do hoti hai. Kya hota? Prices me jo changes aate hain over long period of time, to increase or decrease uski wajah se they were unable to explain the business cycle. Ah, yeah, this is a problem with classical theory. They have no explanation of the business cycle. Um, <coughs> so uh, let's see. Uh, so if you expand the money supply. uh correctly this is something which keynes did not say but it is uh, that money supply just increasing money supply doesn't really help you have to increase money supply in the right way <coughs> so that it <coughs> reaches the sector in which there is unemployment <coughs> basically one way simple way to understand this is to say that businesses <coughs> need money to operate because uh they hire <coughs> labor and they purchase inputs first and then they produce and then they earn money so there is a timing problem that otherwise yani that is why in the standard economic theory money disappears from the system because time is not there <coughs> so if everything is happening at the same time beginning of period end of period then basically the product is produced the uh, firms earn money and then they pay off their uh, laborers and uh, so there is no there is actually no need of money in some sense <coughs> but in real time uh, they need money in order to get started but if there is insufficient money in the system then uh, they will not be able to produce so there will be unutilized capacity so if you pump money into the system then the firms will start be able to produce goods and then they will sell and then they will uh, be able to pay back the loan that they took from the banks in order to get their business started <coughs> so that sh- explains why so if there is unutilized capacity in the economy and the biggest unutilized com- c- capacity is unemployment if there's large numbers of laborers who are unemployed then basically you see what the standard theory is saying that suppose i throw money at these workers 
who are unemployed. What will happen is that the amount of goods that has been produced is fixed. So extra money has been added. So now this money, the only thing it can do is cause inflation. But what it doesn't account for is that when I throw money at the unemployed laborers, they will produce more goods. So the actual amount of quantity of goods that are there in the economy will now increase. So there is extra money and extra product. So this will not necessarily lead to inflation. But uh, now you have to have a lot of you know, <coughs> delicate calculations in the sense that, okay, if you, uh, you give uh, money to <coughs> an unemployed sector, what kind of product will be produced and what kind of demands will be generated? So if you give a l lot of people, a lot of uh, very poor people jobs, the first demand will be for food. So if your food sector is in uh, uh, short supply, then there will be inflation of food prices. So actually one of the first things that you should do is to you know, give jobs to poor people in producing food because that is what will uh, prevent inflation. Alternatively, it is possible to do and many countries have done this, you give them a job which will produce some exportable uh, commodities and you export these and you get money and you import food. This is also another way to handle the problem. But if you just produce domestic uh, commodities for sale, then this will lead to a lowering of the price of the non-food commodities which are being produced because now there is more of them and an increase in the price of food. So in any case, the point is that money is not neutral in the short run if the amount of goods that is being produced can be changed by the use of money. If the amount of goods is the same, then basically you have the quantity equation mv equals pq. q is fixed. So now, and v is assumed to be fixed. So now mv equals pq, if m doubles, then the p will also double. Uh, but if I say that increasing M also will increase Q, which is what I'm saying will happen if you have unemployed resources and if the money is targeted to reach the unemployed resources, then the Q will change because the unemployed resources will come into production. So, so that shows that money is not neutral in the short run. But what about the long run? Why is money not neutral in the long run? <coughs> So this is actually one of the concessions that was made to Keynes that yes, money is neut not neutral in the short run, but it is neutral in the long run. This is what was said by neoclassicals who were defending their theory. So Friedman also agreed that changes in money can cause disturbances in the short run, but in the long run nothing will, nothing will change. In the long run money can only be neutral. <coughs> Yes. Well, exactly. This is the key. Basically, if you invest in capital goods, if you invest in the productive goods, suppose you don't. Suppose all that happens is that you uh, produce more consumer goods and do, uh, consume more consumer goods. Then nothing will happen to the long run trajectory of the economy. But if you build infrastructure, if you build the productive capacity, if you invest in the future of the economy, then the future trajectory of the economy will change. So, <coughs> so the long run uh, productive capacity will be affected. <coughs> this was illustrated very well in the global financial crisis uh, in which basically uh, there was a huge uh, jump uh, decline in production and um, a huge decline in investment and so a recent article by Summers I think says that the uh, we can say that there has been recovery in the economy recovery means many recession is measured by looking at the potential output which is the maximum possible capacity and the actual output which is what is being produced. 
so unemployment and unemployment here refers to not just laborers but uh, factories etc anything which is unutilized for production so if you are, do, are not at full output level then you are then you have a recession and uh, if you are at full output your actual output equals your potential output then that's called full employment so recession is the measure of the difference between the potential output and the uh, actual output so what summer says is that the potential output was projected to grow at about 3% or 4% per year but basically it did not grow at all after the global financial crisis so because of the loss in the uh, productive capacity of the economy now we are saying that we have come out of the recession uh, but the coming out of the recession has not been because um, there has been increased employment but uh, there has been a decrease in the instead of any uh, there has been decrease in the uh, uh, potential output so basically the f the future of the economy has been destroyed by the global financial crisis so that's one thing now in the mm, there was one comment that uh, prices are rigid so basically this is a uh, this is actually a misinterpretation of keynes but this is the common misinterpretation that basically uh, the neoclassical synthesis or the hicks samuelson synthesis we might call it basically what keynes said was radically uh, against uh, classical economics because basically what he said was that supply and demand theory does not work in the labor market so this is really striking at the heart of economic theory because supply and demand everything is supply and demand so uh, they could not accept that so what they did was they put a, a created version of keynesian theory which would reconcile keynes with the classical and the simple trick is to make prices rigid so they say that prices are rigid in the short run it takes a while for prices to change so now when prices are rigid then unemployment is immediate and then there is, there is no uh, advanced fancy theory required because what happens is that uh, what in order to get your real wage to adjust uh, to become lower which is what is needed to equilibrate the market when there is excess supply of labor you need the wage to change and you need the wage to go down but if the prices are rigid prices also includes wage wage is the price of labor then the wage won't go down in the short run which means that in the short run there will be excess unemployment and basically that's what they said this is what keynes is saying that the prices are rigid so there is excess employment in the short run but in the long run everything is fixed and taken care of and then again this phillips curve argument is just a short run temporary phenomena while uh, the prices don't adjust and then you can <coughs> you can fix the problem by pumping money into the system uh, but what will happen is that this will cause uh, accelerating inflation because once the prices start changing so if you pump money into the system then the prices will start increasing and once the prices start increasing then the wage the real wage can go down but then uh, what will happen is that um, yeah the uh, increase in prices gets built into the system because people anticipate and this is a logical argument in the sense that if everybody thinks that the prices will increase by 10% then all people make such plans and then these plans are consistent with each other and they work so it's difficult to uh, once inflation gets started it's hard to stop <clears throat> so this wage price rigidity is the idea that uh, this is the way to make keynes compatible with neoclassical now the supply and demand theory is again valid it's just that in the short run the prices don't adjust so uh, that's uh, it takes a while for the supply and demand theory to work but what keynes actually said was that this is not true that um even if prices are flexible uh you won't get uh uh you won't get real wage to go down 
And what modern monetary theory says is that even if the real wage goes down, that won't uh, cause the labor uh, supply to, uh, that won't cause equilibrium in the labor market. So um, there's lots of evidence for this, and this is, this is one of the central issues that money is not neutral. You see, once you start with this, then you can start to understand history and real world events. So basically, standard macroeconomic theory, which is taught all over the world, makes it impossible for economists to understand what is happening in the real world. Because everything is happening due to fluctuations in money and the prices, and, uh, and the economists are taught that money doesn't matter, so basically it makes it impossible for them to understand what is going on in history. So <coughs> if you ask people what was the gold standard why did it collapse? What replaced it? They have no ideas because according to the economic theory, gold standard, no gold standard, all of this is the same. But actually, pre-World War I, you had a gold standard and this was something quite different. It had different uh, effects on the economy. Then post-World War I, there was the intermediate period where gold standard collapsed and people tried to put it back together. but. Uh, like Humpty Dumpty, they could not put it back together. So then in um, World War II, they decided to go off the gold standard and they went to what is called the gold exchange standard. So the gold exchange standard refers to the fact that dollars were going to be used and dollars could be exchanged for gold. <coughs> and then in 1971, when uh, Vietnam War caused overprinting of dollars. Uh, the Nixon shock, Nixon announced that uh, dollars would not be convertible to gold. And so that created the new regime, which is actually a very, um, and it, this, this was just created by default without actual design. There was lots of efforts made to actually create a new system of trade after the Nixon shock and there were meetings but they could never uh, they could never come to an agreement so there is actually a book called The Failure of the World to uh, create an alternative to of monetary trading system I don't remember it's a long title but basically the meaning of that is that uh, the world did not create another system and this is a great problem until today we need a new system. The current system is not really a very good system at all. It is harmful for everybody, but it's uh, uh, it uh, just occurred by default. So <coughs> the basic Keynesian insight remains valid that money is very important in the short run and in the long run, and nobody understands. Uh, yani nobody understands uh, is not quite true, there are lots of people who do understand, but the mainstream economic theory is uh, strongly opposed to this idea. Now the question is that, why is it so? I mean, this is really very strange. I mean, now we are asking a meta-level question. And this is really the most important thing that you, that I would like to, for you to learn is uh, to think about uh, ideas themselves. There is the ideas and actually the way economics is currently taught is that here is the truth and you believe it. So this is kind of a brainwashing. There is no real um, uh, effort to say that, okay, this is one theory, this is uh, theory X, this is theory Y, they are opposed to each other, let's evaluate and judge and see and <coughs> you can choose for yourself. That would be a non-brainwashing. But today, everywhere <coughs> that economics is taught, it is taught as brainwashing. This is the truth and you should believe it. And you have no options and you have no choices to discuss. If somebody says that here is utility maximization, you say that, well, it doesn't seem right to me. He says that, well, you won't pass your exam if you, <laughs> if you don't <laughs> believe this. So there you have no option. You can't discuss it. So <clears throat> the question is, why? Why is economics not 
I mean, it's not that there are not other theories available. It's not that there are empirical evidences. Why is um, Yani Lucas said that Keynes, you know, we laughed and giggled when Keynes were, Keynes was mentioned because Keynes is so obsolete. So the current labor the text, I have a lecture on Bojas text, which I show, which is a uh, Harvard uh, text in labor economics, is teasing exactly the same theories that Keynes rejected in uh, 1929. So at least there should be a discussion that here is the theory that was valid before Keynes and Keynes came and he pointed out these objections and now we have found such and such answers to these objections. No, this is not what the theory says. In fact, forget about Keynes, uh, Card and Kruger <coughs> wrote this book called Myth and Measurement and this book shows that an increase in minimum wage led to an increase in employment and he has very solid empirical evidence. So at least the Borja's textbook on labor economics should say that here is the evidence and um, here is our argument. So uh, the books mentions because they can't afford not to that there is um, this book by Card and Kruger and it finds this very strange finding that the, when the minimum wage goes up, the employment also goes up and this is in contradiction to our theory. So then he goes on to discuss this. Why is this? So he says, well, our simple and clear theory cannot be wrong. He starts by saying that. So there must be something wrong with Card and Kruger and maybe it's this and maybe it's that. So he discusses four different possibilities as to why Card and Kruger results must be wrong but never mentions the possibility that maybe our labor supply and demand theory is wrong. So this is uh, very strange. Why are people so firmly attached to these theories? So I have explained that this is an ideology, that this is not a empirical theory, this is not a positive theory. Marvin Minsky, who has uh, developed the, the theories of Keynes and he developed what is called the financial fragility hypothesis and basically he says that the uh, Minsky's development on Keynes in the sense that he says, looks at what happens as you start pumping money into the system. So he says initially when you are in depression you get out of the depression and pumping money is helpful. Then as you keep pumping money the economy <coughs> starts to boom and people, um, uh, stocks start to rise and people say, oh, everything is good and they start pumping more money into the economy. And th at this point, uh, what is needed is counter-cyclical theory, but that is uh, the, cent uh, the central bank should try to take money out of the system. But since money is created by the private sector, there is no constraint on that and the private sector starts making profits, so they keep pumping more and more money into the system. At this point, the loans that the private sector is making, uh, there is not enough money being earned to repay them, but there is enough money being paid to pay the interest. So that is phase two of the, so as long as the people who take the loans can make the interest payments on the loans, then the system continues to work. But then the third phase starts where the money that you borrow is not even enough to pay the interest. Because the economy, uh, the economy has a certain real productive capacity, which is, which is fixed. And uh, once you are at the maximum capacity, you can't increase that capacity. But the loans can be made on rising prices of stocks and lands. But uh, if you buy more land, there, this doesn't increase the productive capacity. So the money that can be earned is not uh, parallel to the money that can be the, to the rising prices. So. Now you start give, making loans and then the uh, loans are not even enough to pay back the interest. Uh, so now what happens is that you take borrow, uh, borrow in order to pay interest on your loans and then that is the crisis phase. At that point things are likely to collapse. So this is Minsky theory and it was uh, very closely matched after, uh, after the global financial crisis. 
uh, Minsky got a lot of popularity and lots of people studied it. But um, if you look at the uh, current syllabus of macro all over the world, Minsky is not included in the readings. So this is very strange. I mean, there's a deliberate effort to keep out uh, unorthodox theory. Uh, the same models which failed miserably in the um, global financial crisis, they are continuing to be used and to be taught the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. The main failing of this is that there is only one agent. So if there is one agent, there cannot be deception. Uh, there they cannot be, uh, when you have rational experience, there cannot be the possibility that you know stock market is going to collapse because you have rational experience. If it collapses, then you know it's going to collapse. If, if it's go booming, then you know it's going to boom. That's what rational expectations means. So, <laughs> all of these theories, any, after the global financial crisis, people should have said, okay, let's go back to the drawing board, let's make new theories. Actually, they didn't need to make new theories because there exist already good theories which explain everything which happened. So, what should have happened is that these theories should have been adapted. So now the meta level question, why do these failed theories continue to be taught when superior alternatives are available, when all the data available contradicts these theories and favors the alternative theories, then uh, there is a, um, a puzzle. There are so many fallacies that all of you have been <coughs> given an assignment to find one of the fallacies, one of the standard conventional theories and um, oppose it with something that is genuine. And so it's not just that there is one theory, uh, although money is the at the heart of it, but there are hundreds of false theories. And actually, very interestingly, today and these days, the debate on modern monetary theory is heating up. Just recently, uh, Larry Summers gave a, uh, a, 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 a statement against it and many other people. So this is a good sign. It means that uh, the challenge is being felt as a threat to the mainstream. So um, the mainstream theory is uh, completely ridiculous in terms of, if you look at the empirical evidence, you look at the reality, it's strongly contradicted by this and modern monetary theory is strongly favored. So um, basically um, we need to look at uh, lots of people have realized that economic theory is fallacious but so Joan Robinson said that learn economics to avoid being deceived by economists. One of her major uh, contributions was to say that this theory of marginal product of labor is wrong and wage equal uh, that in fact what she said was that you cannot calculate the marginal product of labor. Why? It's a very simple argument. What she says is that um, first you need to aggregate the capital. Any, if you look at different firms, different places have different uh, types of production functions, etc. And laborers have different types of productivity. And it's very easy to see. I mean, the wages are different. And in fact, uh, people who looked at this, they found that the same type of labor performing similar types of work are receiving different wages. So there is a differential wages in different industries. So all of this is in contradiction with the idea that there is a single market for labor. So um, now in order to build your aggregate production function, which is where you get your marginal product of labor, you have to aggregate the capital. But how can you aggregate? Uh, supposedly your capital is physical quantity of capital that you are looking at. Physical quantity of labor and physical quantity of capital. But to aggregate the capital, you have to use the price of capital to uh, convert everything into a dollar value. 
but the price of capital comes out of the production function because the price of capital is the partial derivative of the production function with respect to capital. That's the marginal physical product of capital and that has to be converted by the price to get you the marginal revenue product of capital and that is the price of capital in a competitive <coughs> economy. But he says that so you are using a circular argument, you are using these prices which you got from the uh, production function in order to be able to create the aggregate capital and this cannot be done and um, so you are assuming, uh, you are building, uh, uh, you are, this is a circular argument in which uh, you use what you are trying to prove in order to prove the argument. So that was called the Cambridge Capital Controversy which was eventually conceded. It was called the Cambridge Controversy because there was Cambridge in which there was Robinson and some of her uh, school, I've forgotten the names, and in, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts you know, there was Solo and somebody else. So uh, the two Cambridges on the, on, the, on the American side they said no, no it's uh, correct and on the British side they said no, it's wrong, you can't aggregate capital. And ultimately, the US side conceded that yes, you can't. So, so they lost the battle, but they won the war in the sense that they said, okay, yes, uh, Solo said that this is really a parable, this is not really true, but it's a story that we tell which is convenient and simplifying. And then this story continues to be told in all textbooks and there is not even any mention of the Cambridge controversy. So that's why Joan Robin says that you have to learn economics to avoid being deceived by economists. Ariel Rubinstein, who is a very famous game theorist, he said that in 40 years I have not come across a single real world application of ga game theory. So I, at one point uh, I was having this debate with some economists and I said to people who were defending, I, I said that all of economics is garbage. They said, no, no, don't be so extreme. So they said, okay, I said, okay, uh, if you want to um, argue, then find me one idea uh, from economic theory which gives us some insight that is not available to common sense. And I did not receive uh, any answer to this. Basically, nobody could come up with any theory. You see, uh, you have to be a little bit careful in the sense that, okay, there is uh, supply and demand. If something increases in supply, the price will decline. Okay. That's something which everybody understands. You don't need mathematics. You don't need... So, as, a, as I said, every theory has a core of truth. Something which is basic, common sense, simple idea which everybody understands, which, for which you don't need to learn calculus. And Then, on this top of this uh, core truth, a whole complicated theory is built and it is argued that this theory is true because of this core truth. So this is how the deception operates, that there has to be some element of truth. So you talk about utility maximization. So you say that, well, everybody do acts in order to uh, to further their own, own interest. Well, that's already a little bit um, difficult because your own interest is not well defined. And they say, okay, we allow that your own interest, may, you may want me care for others, okay. So at that at the point when they are defending their theory, they use a different argument. Then when they come to presenting their theory, it's completely different. Now they say that, okay, utility function is like this and we have already proven that it would be maximized. So they don't show that what we are doing here, we have added a lot more assumptions from the argument that we defended was entirely different and the, what we are saying is entirely different. So a lot more hidden assumptions have been added and then you are saying that everybody agrees that yes, we all ut maximize utilities. So the same thing happens in um, all uh, areas that there is some simple common sense idea which everybody agrees with and then on top of that, for example, supply and demand theory, okay. Uh, on, on the one hand, it's simple and basic and true. There is nothing wrong with supply and demand. If people increase their demand and there is a fixed supply, then the price will increase. And if you throw a lot more goods and people don't want it, then its price will decrease. There is no question about that. But the theory that is called supply and demand economics is not this simple theory. It says that every person, every consumer 
maximizes the utility and that creates uh, then you look at the aggregate demand and that's a demand function and then every firm uh, maximizes profits and there is competitive equilibrium so all of these things uh, is the supply and demand now this theory is completely wrong your consumers do not maximize utility and and uh, firms do not maximize profits and the, uh, the theory of competitive markets doesn't hold so all of this is wrong but uh, basically there is a fallacy which is called fallacy of affirming the consequent uh, something like that um, modus ponens okay so uh, there's a uh, complicated greek name which i have forgotten uh, but basically you see uh, if x implies y and you observe y this doesn't mean that x is true this is the basic fallacy that i am trying to say now if x implies y and y is not there then uh, x must be false this is called modus tollens and that is the true uh, uh, true logical argument that my theory implies that such uh, my theory implies that if wages uh, if there is a minimum wage which is above the equilibrium wage this will cause unemployment uh, increase in unemployment so when we go and we look and we see that an increase in minimum wage does not lead to increase in employment then the theory is rejected now if my theory says that um if i put the minimum wage below the equilibrium wage nothing will change and i go and i put the minimum wage below the equilibrium nothing changes i see look my theory of supply and demand is true because it implies something which we saw that is the wrong argument so if our theory of supply and demand which says that you know there's profit maximization there's competitive markets there's uh, utility maximization and this leads to supply and demand and what it implies is that if something is increased in supply the prices will go down now look so uh, something increased in supply prices went down my theory is true now a huge number of false assumptions have been made but there is one true implication and now we say okay uh, my theory has been proven because so this is the wrong logic <clears throat> and this is the logic that is used to prove these theories so the so now when we come to the challenge i say that okay find me an idea which is different from what any and you take any person in the street and ask him this question and so something which is simple and common sense but uh, which economic theory says that no this simple common sense is wrong uh, you tell me uh, such a theory and um, uh, no there was no answer now um, uh, similarly in econometrics find me a single regression equation which gives uh, something some insight into the world which is valid which you cannot get by common sense so that's the important part that something which is simple plain common sensical uh, that we don't uh, accept as an accomplishment of economics or as an accomplishment so now there are some very smart people in the world there is this book uh, what is it called uh, Uh, I've forgotten the name of the book again. There is something about how economic theory gives us some tremendous insights about the world. It is a very popular book. It's written for a mass audience. So Ariel Rubinstein again analyzes the book. He says that the author of this book is very smart. He has come up to uh, with a lot of very brilliant insights. But these insights don't come from economic theory. these are insights that he had and then he used economic theory to justify them so it seems as if you are getting these insights from economic theory but actually you are and you have and this is how uh, i mean there are lots of smart economists and lots of good articles in e economics which give you a lot of understanding about what the real world is so it's not that but the e the economic theory portion the economic theory doesn't get you there in fact Krugman said this uh, himself that you know in our times it was understood because the uh, economic theory is very ideological 
and after the Lucas uh, uh, revolution, basically in the 1970s, 80s, uh, the only acceptable models in economic theory were ones in which every person does intertemporal utility maximization. If the behavior is not so, all, all the consumers and all the firms they must uh, maximize firms must maximize proper profits intertemporally and and uh, consumers must maximize utility. If the model doesn't have this, then it's not an economic theory model. So Krugman said that uh, we, uh, in, in our time, uh, it was understood by everybody, all the graduate students who were trying to write papers and get published and get tenure and get uh, <coughs> admission, <coughs> that the way to write such a paper was to come up with some basically sensible theory and then cover it up with this maximization nonsense because that was the only way to get published. So first you develop your own idea and theory and, and then you create a model on top of that which will support your theory and basically this is how models are constructed and people have the very wrong idea especially innocent students that we learn about the world by models that we, we study the model and then from the model we learn about the model, world. This is completely wrong. Actually <coughs> what happens is that you study the world and you uh, try to simplify what you see into some, uh, some yani. So you know in the world you see tall people and short people but you understand that the height is not a relevant factor when it comes to finding jobs mostly. <coughs> Unless it's basketball. <coughs> so you say that okay this is not going to be a factor so basically you um, you abstract those factors which you think are important and then you say okay then you again you think about what the factors are which are going to matter and how they are going to matter and then once you have your idea then you build a model on the basis of your idea so it's first you have some understanding of the real world from that you create a model and the model may or may not it's an attempt to simplify the world to some simple elements. So then you calculate your model and then you see if the results match. If the results don't match, that means that your model has missed something important and usually you can find out by checking between the match of the results of your model and reality. And this is what <laughs> basically, this is what I would like for you guys to learn via agent-based modeling because those are better models that you can understand and then you can correlate with the real world as opposed to this intertemporal maximization models which are common in economics which have nothing to do with reality. So if, even if the model doesn't match, you don't know anything, you don't learn anything. But the AB mod, ABM models are ones in which you say, okay, here is the agent and here is how he behaves and now you let them interact and you see if it <coughs> looks like what you see in the real world and what you see in the real world you can see by using experiments. So what I am doing here is introducing a new technique, experimental economics and agent based, which is a replacement for what is currently done all over the world in economics. And this is the way of the future. This is how you can provide an alternative to modern economics. Tim Gooding is publishing his book. So I have heard. So I have heard. He wrote to me about that. You guys have taken the course no. from Tim Gooding, right? Yes. So there is a lot of things that can be done by agent based one that nobody has done and that's relatively easy to do. <coughs> so basically the reality is not difficult to understand but unlearning is very difficult. And as Keynes said, difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from the old ones. The training that you receive in economics is very heavy and deep brainwashing. People keep asking questions like <coughs> price rigidities and utility maximization and many other things, supply and demand. And people say, well, what can possibly be wrong with supply and demand? It makes perfect sense. And it does. Intuition, intuitively, it makes perfect sense. But when you translate it into the mathematical theory, it does not make sense. But people cannot understand the difference between the mathematical theory and the intuitive theory. <coughs> because the people don't understand mathematics. So they don't understand that when you have put in 
that okay i maximize utility of consumption that you have made the person be indifferent to anything everybody else does because that's not written and it's not explained that now your utility depends only on what you eat and you don't care anything about what other people are getting <coughs> so this is not actually true but you were never told this you were told that people any yani the justification was different so these are the things that keynes said when he tried to explain his unorthodox ideas to the economists of the time and nobody actually understood and finally we came up with the hicks samuels and synthesis which basically takes keynes and misinterprets him so that keynesian ideas become compatible with classical ideas keynes is short run economics and Uh, new classical is long run economics in the short run you have price rigidity so supply and demand doesn't equilibrate so one way to get rid of this is to pump prices into the system that will cause the prices to change and then ultimately you will come back to the equilibrium full employment which is the uh, keynes said that no and um, uh, unemployment equilibria can persist for a long time <coughs> and that the future is not known this is one of the radical ideas of keynes is that the future is unknown this is very different from rational expectations uh rational expectation says the future is unknown but it is predictable that there are five different states and they have these probabilities so we can actually calculate the expected value he says no there may there may be many states which we simply don't know what state will come up we don't even know which states there are so <coughs> so many people got the idea that macro is in big trouble uh and many people have said things like this so paul Rim- romer uh says that the real business cycle models everything happens because of these errors that you tack on at the end what are these errors nobody knows so basically uh yani business cycle are called by these unobserved errors which we don't know what they are so basically all of the action takes place because of things that we don't know anything about so this is rather ridiculous this the imaginary forces which are causing all the economic change so paul romer talks about the they dismiss facts uh, which contradict their theories so basically he's in his text he cites an example uh, he uh, the of economist says i don't know whether um, a tight monetary policy can cause a recession he said you know this is a world class macroeconomist and he's saying that tight monetary policy cannot cause recessions or at least he says that i don't know and this is so well established and he gives an example of the woker recession which he shows that when woker um came into power in in the 1979 uh, or 80 then basically he said that i'm going to bring inflation under control the economy was in uh, stagflation mode uh, in the 70s after the oil crisis and so he said okay i'm going to bring inflation under control so he he ran a tight monetary policy that led to a sharp jump in unemployment so he pulled back for a while and then he said okay unemployment doesn't matter let's kill the inflation so then he ramped up the <coughs> interest rate which caused a recession but it also did bring down inflation so uh to think that and he so is that it's he said that i am going to do this and it's going to have this effect and then he did it and that had that effect and then to say that uh that money is uh, neutral it just seems completely ridiculous i mean it seems like any um uh, rejection of fact basically that's right any this is this is so flabbergasting that look there is this wall he says i don't know whether there is a wall or not so this is the this is the level of which Uh, at which macroeconomists today world class leading economists whose textbooks are taught are rejecting simple facts of reality
So, simple basic facts about macro, we have already discussed this, that uh, money is not neutral, but real business cycle says that money is neutral, Nairu says that money is neutral, Lucas thinks that money is neutral. So, <coughs> again thinking at the metal level, truth is not hard to see, truth is a very powerful agent of change, ideas change the world. This truth is being deliberately concealed by massive propaganda in form of economic theories. And these theories, the economic theory, is the biggest obstacle to understanding reality. So how can we change things? We should study history instead of math. Math is the biggest weapon of mass deception. Once you start teaching students math, students give up. They say that this is beyond my understanding. I have to just memorize. Economics is not possible for human beings to understand. So let those people who understand mathematics understand. I just try to get by with, if I can make a B in this course, I'll be very happy. <coughs> That's all I have to do. I just have to uh, learn the mathematics that is required to pass the exam. Understanding economics is not within my possibility. Once you think that economics is math, then this is almost naturally follows. So there are very few people who have sufficient talent with math to be able to understand what the math is actually saying. And this is never actually taught. So I mean you have to do this on your own. If people were trying to explain what the math says, then you would be able to see. But people don't try to explain, so you have to f do this on your own. So <coughs> if you study history, then you will be able to understand what is happening if you and there's just that's one simple tool then. Uh, the money matters. Too much money will lead to inflation. Too little will lead to recession. These are very simple ideas which are very easy to understand. Businesses need money to run. If you uh, starve them of money, they will not be able to run. So you will have a recession. And if you have lots of money, everybody is, uh, and if you are at full production, then excess money cannot cause more production. So what will happen is people will buy more imports or prices will go up. This is again, yani baby level understanding of economics. You don't need more than that. You don't need fancy curves and diagrams. You don't need ISLM curves. <coughs> uh, with this simple understanding, which is denied to economists. Yani, once you study economic theory, you lose your ability to see these simple basic things, which everybody can see with two eyes. <coughs> so economics actually blinds you that uh, there is that Indian movie. <laughs> where the, what is it called? The, the famous movie with the... Black? Nay, there's uh, the one uh, child is blinded so that he can become a beggar. And the other child runs away. Slumdog. Ah, slumdog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it is like this. The economists are blinded so that they can earn money and they can be part of the system of defending capitalism. <coughs> So then they cannot see the real world. <clears throat> so the beginning of macro is to understand Keynesian economics. But there is one um, caution that we need to add, which is Keynes said that if you just expand money supply, you will get to unemployment. This is not necessarily true. Money has to reach the right hand, so it has to be put into the right sector and things are a little bit more complicated than what Keynes said. So the amount of money is of critical importance according to Keynes. It must be maintained at the right level. Again, this is not exactly true as, uh, as MMT says that we, many level can actually vary. But uh, to a first approximation, this is a good understanding that if you have too little money, it causes recession, too much causes inflation, so money has to be at exactly the right level. So this is now exactly the opposite of the neutrality of money. Money is all important. Money has to be at exactly the right level in order for the economy to function well with no inflation and no unemployment. <coughs> so one very important consequence which very few people understand is that gold system is bad. The gold standard is bad because the gold standard fixes the amount of money at a level which has nothing to do with the needs of the economy. <coughs> <coughs> and this is basically the reason why the gold standard didn't work for a long time and it collapsed. 
because the needs of the economy kept changing the solution one solution is that and this is the solution that was suggested by Hume and, uh, and others that okay if the uh, if you have neutrality of money basically if there's too little gold then the prices will go down if there's too much gold the prices will go up so the economy can function but this doesn't work uh, the prices do not adjust fast enough and if the prices do adjust this causes a lot of disturbances in the economy especially deflation it can happen and too little gold will lead to reduced prices and eventually uh, if the prices are sufficiently low then you can get the economy started back because when the prices are very low then the small amount of gold will become enough but this is a very painful and uh, and long term process <coughs> and harmful so the other solution <coughs> <coughs> is fractional reserve banking which means that you can use a little bit of gold but you can print a lot of money so that works as long as you only have domestic economy but when you have international trade then you have serious problems <coughs> so um, because uh, as long as you have um, Yani, if you start pumping money into the economy to uh, create uh, expansion to get out of recession and you uh, <coughs> change the reserve ratio then for domestic economy this is fine but now when you are trading with others then your currency doesn't have the same gold backing and so uh, your exchange ratio or your foreign exchange rate will have to change so <coughs> there is this basic dilemma this is the trilemma either you have a free monetary policy you handle your domestic economy then your exchange rate will be unstable uh, so your exchange rate will change now suppose you want to keep the exchange rate the same then the only thing that is possible is that you cannot allow them to exchange, convert. So there are these three things, capital controls, exchange rates and um, domestic economy. <coughs> and all three you cannot have. Uh, if you have a free movement of capital, then the other uh, uh, and, and uh, you have um, uh, free money and, and free exchange rates, then you cannot manage your domestic economy. We, we discussed the trilemma last time. So this is another way to see about it, that to, to see that the trilemma is there. <coughs> so I don't know that I allowed for much discussion this time, but are there any questions? I hope that this, maybe if you listen to the lecture again, you will find it more clear. I am caught in the dilemma that I don't have enough time to give to the students. On the one hand, you need to give the lecture, then you do need the discussion, but I don't have time. But you do need discussions, and it would be very useful. I think the paper that uh, I asked you to write is useful, but also uh, you should have study groups among yourselves and discuss these ideas, and especially it would be very useful to debate these ideas with other students who are taking economics in other places, because then when you get a real uh, counter, then you will be able to understand both sides and that's very useful in developing your understanding because you will see what are the normal rejection. As I am teaching you, I am just brainwashing you. You just accept whatever I say without thinking about it. So until you fight against this idea, you will not understand why it is actually true and what are the best defenses against it. So, because uh, teachers, students automatically accept whatever the teacher says, so you don't get the chance to fight. So if you take these ideas to the world and debate with them on blogs, on, on your WhatsApp groups, then you will find a lot of people who will uh, challenge anything you say, and then you will be able to see the extent to which you understand by seeing if you can defend the idea or not, and then you will get much better understanding of these ideas. All right, so.